joined by Alfonso Pecatiello of the Macro Compass, filmed in the New York studios of Blockworks. It is, I believe, October 2nd. Alfonso, great to have you back on Forward Guidance. How are you doing? Very good, Jack. Nice to see you in person. I flew all the way, a bit jet lagged, but happy to do the interview. And so, Alf, you know, we just had a fantastic lunch. So, you know, the, the macro thoughts are, are brewing. Uh, we are right now in the midst of a huge sell-off in bonds, particularly long duration bonds. What do you make of it? What, what are your thoughts? I think we're watching what uh, the bond market likes to do late cycle. It's not the first time you get this uh, bear steepening, which we're going to talk about late in the cycle. Um, also, oil prices, I think, are testing the, econ- the economy and this idea that the, you know, the economy is resilient. This time is different, that we can handle higher oil prices, that the economy can work and function with 5% interest rates. Well, you get this theory tested, I think, through bond markets and through um, oil prices. And this is a thing that tends to happen late in the cycle, mechanically, because people who were invested in insurance trades in recessionary trades. So they were short energy, they were into the long end of the bond markets, they were long bonds, they have to give up at some point their insurance because there is no recession. If for six or nine months you're spending insurance premium in being short risk assets, in being long, the long end part of the bond market, and then this insurance doesn't pay off because there is no recession, you can only keep it for as long on your books until you are forced to give it up. And while you give it up as well, the narrative changes. And that's what we are seeing today. The narrative morphs into, oh, if we didn't get a recession so far, we are never going to get one. This time is different. The economy can handle 5% interest rates. The Federal Reserve starts to tell you the same. They change their dots. They don't raise the neutral rate, but they basically do that by saying, wow, we'll have to take inflation-adjusted Fed funds to plus 1.5% for three years to go. They start going really big in the higher for longer camp. And so the narrative changes and bond markets start to believe that narrative and test it. So they go and they say, why don't we raise long end bond deals? Why don't we make the cost of financing much more expensive throughout the curve? Why don't we normalize term premium? In other words, they tighten the screw really on the economy by raising long term interest rates and they in this way test whether this hypothesis is really true. If this is true, that this time is different, then nothing bad is going to happen, Jack, because all of a sudden we can handle 5% interest rates for long. The stock market's going to be doing fine. The economy is going to be doing fine. Problem is that every time in the past, late cycle, we tested the hypothesis that this time is different. September 2018, late 2007, late 2000, it ended up that this time wasn't different. Either we had a labor market recession in 2001, we had the great financial crisis in 2008, and we had basically a credit market freeze and an equity market drawdown in 2018, November, December, that led to the power pivot. So often, this time isn't different, but the bond markets likes to test the hypothesis late cycle. So do you think this time is different? And if it's not different, where are we? Okay, so... um, The big answer is no, this time isn't different. Uh, There are many nuances to uh, discuss though. So the thing that has taken me off guard and with hindsight, it's simple now because with hindsight, everything is easy, right? Is basically that the macro lags, which normally apply between yield curve inversion or the first Federal Reserve hike and the pain being felt in the real economy and in markets, as a median time lag, so let's say this macro lag is a median time of about 16 to 18 months. This is the median. The short side of it is about 12. The long side of it is 24 to 27 months. Now, when is the starting date? The starting date is about May, June, 2022. This is when the yield curve inverted consistently so for the first time and stayed inverted ever since, basically. So if we start counting from, let's say, May 2022, we are now in the month 15, 16, okay? So we are walking towards the median time when history would say, now you should start feeling really the hit from the tightening financial conditions, the ill curve inversion, et cetera, et cetera. Have we felt the hit so far? 
a bit, one would say. The labor market is much slower than it was at the beginning of the year. Core inflation is slowing down. The housing market has decelerated. But is this really pain if measured against how much tightening the Fed has done? Well, the magnitude has been pretty disappointing, right? Has been, has been catching a lot of people by surprise. So why is that? I mean, one should always take new information coming in and assess where do we stand in the macro cycle. And I think it's basically two reasons. One is that the fiscal spending has been outsized by any historical standard for this point in the cycle, especially between October 22 and October 2023. So that's the last fiscal year, which just exhausts as we speak. And the second has been that the length of the macro lags mostly and really depend on when is the effect of higher interest rate going to be felt by, by the economy. And that is when refinancing comes due, when the refinancing bill comes due. There are two channels, really, when you feel the hit of higher interest rates as the private sector. The first is if you have floating rate financing, then you're going to feel it pretty much immediately, right? Because your financing is linked to floating rates. And so if the Fed hikes, you're going to feel it straight away. The second is how much refinancing do you actually need to do over, say, the next 12 months? And the U.S. economy was very shielded from both perspectives because the floating rate borrowing, both from households and from corporates, is very limited in the United States. And also the refinancing cliffs were pushed out into the future because corporates borrowed for a very long period fixed during the pandemic. They took advantage of very low interest rate and the same did households with mortgages. So that means the refinancing cliffs are pushed down in the future. Floating mortgages and floating corporate borrowing doesn't really exist in the U.S. It's very small, so you don't feel the hit very, very well. And the pain of higher rates is felt by lenders, not borrowers. It's felt by people who bought the bond, not the people who borrowed and issued the bonds. Yes, until you actually need to refinance. The moment that the refinancing bill comes due, then you have to face the reality of much higher interest rates. Okay, So then... For basically the first half of this year, you had the fiscal tailwinds and the fact that the refinancing cliffs were really non-existent in the United States were very, very small. And that has explained, I think, why the direction of travel has been correct. So yes, tightening is working. The labor market is slowing. Core inflation is slowing. But it is doing that at a very moderate pace. And why the macro lags in this part of the cycle might actually be more on the long side than on the short side. It's because the refinancing cliffs really are coming due only gradually in the U.S. in 24 and 25. But now, the fun part of it is that we are moving towards the part where you are on the medium long side of the macro lags. So that will be anything between 18 and 24 months, which would basically be the next six to nine months. Anything between now and the first half of next year gets us in the red hot zone of historical macro lags. That's where it's more likely that the previous tightening actually hits the economy. But now that it's becoming more likely, because the fiscal tailwinds are receding, because the refinancing cliffs are coming closer, instead, the narrative has completely changed. The narrative has changed into recession. What? We're going to have one at all? This time is different, man. Everything, you know, the economy can handle 5% interest rates. And this dichotomy between a data-driven process which signals that it is more likely that we are going to get some more pressure on the private sector over the next six months, and the market-driven narrative of what pressure are you talking about, this dichotomy is very common late cycle. In September 2018, just to bring ourselves to the closest period where something like this was happening, at a lower scale, but it was happening, let me bring you back to that period. It's not a long time ago, so it's easy to, to really feel it again. Trump had cut taxes in 2017, and the reverberation of that fiscal tailwind was still going through the economy for the first half of 2018. So the U.S. economy was doing pretty okay. Core inflation, that's the main difference, was only 2%. But the labor market was tight, and so the Federal Reserve thought, well, let me preemptively hike rates a bit further just to make sure that, you know, we don't get a overheated labor market on top of an already um, 2% inflation. And so by September, Powell was hiking, we were doing quantitative tightening, but by September 2018, the economy wasn't slowing enough. 
as the Fed wanted them to slow it. And so Powell had a famous speech where he said, I think we're far off neutral rates. And what that meant is that what the Fed thought it was a tight policy wasn't really tight because if neutral rate is higher, they'll need to tighten more in order to be, you know, really applying pressure on the economy. So the bond market went into a bear steepening. It took front end rates higher, priced more hikes by the Fed, but also because the Fed thought and was sending the message that the economy could handle more, that, that neutral rates were higher, ha more hikes in the next six to nine months weren't translating into more damage and more cuts further. So the curve wasn't inverting as a result, but instead more hikes coming now could be held by the economy over time. So you didn't need to price in more cuts as an outcome, but because the economy could handle it, basically, you had a bear steepening of the curve. This was September to October and November 2018. And then in December, we found out the economy couldn't handle it. The credit market froze. High yield issuance was nowhere to be seen. Apple drew down 25% in six weeks. And that was basically a miniature version of what I think the bond market is trying to do today, what the Federal Reserve is telling us today, that higher for longer, the economy can handle it, the bond market is testing it, crude oil prices are testing it, and I don't think this time will be different in the end. Thanks, Al. I, I want to get into later the bear steepening and get really into the details. So, you know, the bond uh, nerds watching this, they, they will be very, very pleased later on uh, in the interview. But first, just to get you on your macro views on, on stocks and bonds. So if that 2018 parallel holds, this would now be a good time to be overweight bonds and underweight equities. What is your current view on bonds and how has it changed since the last conversation? I don't know if it was February or, or April, but you were quite, uh, I think, bullish on bonds then, expecting a, a recession by the summer. And, and you said new in, in your thinking, uh, you've incorporated the uh, fiscal drag as well as the longer lags. Is that such a big adjustment that you're now... Uh, you know, bullish on bonds, but less bullish on bonds, or are, are you more bullish? Because I think if you know, if your framework, uh, if, if you were bullish on bonds when they were, you know, at four percent or wherever they were, four point seven percent seems like a pretty good good deal. So how are you thinking about duration now? Because even I, I'm looking at the, the you know the four point seven percent. I'm saying, hey, it's not too bad. So I think we should pull uh, a Twitter poll ah, yeah. that I made because I think here it fits pretty well. So um, the let's look at the poll first, okay? So I asked uh, Twitter, Fintwit, where do they think 10-year bond yields are going to be in six months from now, I think it was the question. And you had three answers, three answers possible. The first one was based, basically the body of the distribution, the more likely outcome. So I took basically 30 basis points up and down on 10-year treasury yields. That's a normal range of volatility for this kind of instrument in this kind of period. That was one option. And I think it was 10-year treasury yields between 430 and 490, something along these lines. And when you asked this poll, it was two weeks ago or so on the 22nd of September when the, it was at 4.45%. It's higher now. Yeah. But so it's a uh, door number two was the sort of right in the middle thing where if historical patterns hold, the, the, you know, things don't crash and it's not a tail risk scenario. But door number one and door number three was at below 3.75, so a huge rally in bonds or above 5%, a huge sell-off in bonds. Yeah. And actually, it actually has so happened that since then we have had a huge sell-off in bonds, but that's kind of irrelevant to the sentiment. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the way I see it is you make a poll and you tell people, here is the most likely answer, and then here are the tails. So bond bulls, bond bears, please show up to the party. I want to measure how many bond bears and bond bulls do we have, at least in terms of sentiment. How do you feel about being a bond bull or a bond bear? It's basically a narrative check. It's a sentiment check. And one caveat here to understand is that bonds are generally a portfolio hedge, especially in these inflationary environments. If equities are drawing down, bonds would normally serve as a- In a recession, bond. bonds do very well too. For example, right? And so you would expect that more people, as we get closer to a weaker economy, a weaker labor market, would attach a premium, an insurance premium basically to the tail that protects the portfolio. So they would expect bonds to basically, uh, they, they would attach a higher probability to bonds being lower in yields in that tail because maybe they expect a recession to come. But because they don't expect the recession to come anymore, Jack, and because the narrative and the sentiment 
And the, the sell-off in bond. And the sell-off in bond is validating this narrative. There is nothing that validates narrative more than price. They feed themselves very, very closely. You are getting now the tale of people that think that in six months from now, 10-year treasury yields are going to be above 5%. That's an event that if historical patterns would hold, would happen about 7% of the times, 35% of the people on Fintwit voted that that tale would realize. And so why do I think that's relevant? It's because if I take the same poll back in 2021, when I asked the opposite question, in the late September of 2021, I asked people, well, the forward markets are pricing some, some hikes by the Fed in 2022, much less than realized, but some hikes were priced in. Let me ask you, Fintwit, what is the probability that the Fed basically is going to make one or two hikes and anything is going to fall apart after that? There was a 10% probability priced by markets and 40% of people on Fintwit told me as an answer to that poll that the Fed could only hike once or twice. That was the map. And that bonds were a buy. And back then, inflation was rising. So fundamentally, the case for bonds was getting weaker. But bonds actually were rallying, I think, from February to that summer. Correct. So you had the opposite yeah. uh, situation, right? Price was validating an narrative that basically said the Fed can never hike if they hike twice, but world's is going to fall apart. Be long bonds, fade this hiking price in markets. What happened in 2022? The worst year on record, I think, for long and duration, right? And now you're having the opposite. The economy is weakening, inflation is coming down, but the narrative is the opposite. The narrative is higher for longer. Prices are coming down. The price is validating the narrative, and you have Fintwit telling you that there is a 35% probability of a very small tail event, which 10-year treasury yields are going to be higher than 5% in six months from now. So what that tells me is that sentiment is definitely bearish. It isn't the only ingredient necessary to get a bond rally, but obviously. You have sentiment, which is bearish. You have bond yields that you need to consider as a starting point, right, when making your decision. Why would you have bonds in a portfolio is historically they serve as a hedge against risk assets drawdown in a disinflationary environment, okay? So if you get disinflation back again and equities are drawing down and credits are drawing down and commodities are drawing down, bonds will normally be your diversifier in your portfolio. Now, if you want an insurance, kind of trade in your portfolio, you want to have it at interest rates or at levels you lock in that are above inflation and that are acceptable for your long-term returns. And if you have 30-year treasury yields close to 5%, you are most likely above inflation. So real rates basically are positive. So you, you validate the first requirement. You have a portfolio hedge with a positive real return to start with. So you don't pay for the insurance. You actually get paid for the insurance. That's the positive real yield you lock in. And on top of it, you buy at levels that will really provide you with a tailwind of returns if something goes wrong. So you're right. The starting point for 75, 5% matters. From a portfolio hedge perspective, bonds now look much more appealing than they were 12 months ago. So are you very bullish on bonds right now? The answer is not finished, almost. Okay. So I am. So I think in a portfolio, they should always have a place. If you ask me whether I'm overweight, the answer is yes, I am overweight. Then the last part of the answer is, what's the time horizon that you expect bonds to deliver a positive performance? And here, I think you have to be a bit more patient than the past, really, because of two reasons. The first one is these macro lags we discussed might be a bit longer, so it might take a little bit longer for the economy to really weaken. But the second important thing is the Fed's hands are tied, Jack. Contrary to 2018, when core inflation was 2%, and when the credit market froze, and when equity markets drew down, and Jay Powell in January 2019, immediately thereafter, made a speech that basically said, sorry guys, we tightened too much, forget about it, we are stopping the tightening. We did enough. And a few months later, he was cutting rates. This time, he can't do it. So say you follow the normal sequencing. Late cycle bear steepening. Long and bond rates go higher. Crude oil prices move higher. The private sector is taxed by all of that. Right when the labor market is lowing, a few months later, this generates a crack somewhere. It can be credit markets. can be equity markets the equity market drops 20, 30%. Let's assume we follow this pattern, Jack. 
and saying we are at the end of the year, beginning of next year, with the equity markets down 20%. But core inflation is still at four. What's the Fed going to do? Can Powell show up in January 2024 and say, sorry, guys, we tightened too much. Uh, we are not going to stop tightening. We're going to reverse QT. We are actually probably thinking about cutting rates. Can you foresee himself having the credibility necessary with inflation still at 4% to show up and preemptively ease conditions? Or will it be a reactive reaction to something really going wrong? I think the Fed hands are tied when it comes to proactively rescuing markets, which means bonds can only rally for last. So the sequence is equity markets go down, credit markets freeze. The situation becomes pretty scary, but core inflation is still too high. So it takes a while for Powell to really cave in. And when he does, then the bond market really rallies very, very hard, but it does so for last. So it takes a little bit longer than usual, I think, to get this return from bond market long. But when it does, it's going to be a very, very large and complex return. So are you more bullish on bonds now than when you were six months ago? Uh, the answer is, I think long term returns now are more attractive. Yeah. So if I look at the risk reward, the risk reward now is much better because you are later in the cycle and because the starting yield is better than before, which me means the risk reward is really more in your favor. But making a thorough analysis of the cycle we are in, including the fiscal, including the macro lags, including the refinancing, means that I need to be wary of the fact that to get these big returns from bonds, it might take a little bit longer yeah. than I thought. That's where I mm -hmm. So that makes sense. But it is, it is I mean, for... 4.7% is a lot better than 3.5% oh, yes. six months ago. Yes, definitely. So the starting point matters because it yeah. makes the risk reward more skewed in your favor. Uh, we also need to talk about, can you still lose a lot of money in bonds by having them in your portfolio? When we talk about the risk reward, we're talking about the reward side now. So the entry level is good. The real yields locked in are good. The potential uh, drop in yields, especially if something goes wrong late cycle, it's very large. From 4.7, you can drop quite a lot. So great. The reward looks good. The, the coupon's higher. The coupon's higher. So if it, if it goes, sells off, you're, you're earning income to compensate that, right. which at 1%, it was basically nothing. So the carry is yeah, better. Carry, yeah. So the, the real yields you lock in are better. The portfolio hedge function of your bond long is much better now. The potential reward can be extremely large. What about the risk? Right? That's the other side yeah. of the equation. So what can go wrong? if you overweight bonds right now in the cycle. Okay, so we need to do some bond math together to figure out if you're buying 30-year treasuries at 475%, which I think is roughly where we are as we speak, how much money can you lose in this position? So let's think of 30-year bond yields as the strip of all future Fed funds over the next 10 years. And then let's add a component called term premium. Okay? I think that's the easiest way to go around this. So 30-year bond yields um, are basically the reflection of what the Fed will be doing over the next 30 years. But then obviously, the next 5 to 10 years are somehow in the prediction horizon. What comes after is uncertainty. And that's what the term premium really pays you for. But okay, let's first go to the first leg, right? So Fed funds are now 525. There is about a 50% chance the Fed will hike again to five and a half, according to markets, about. There used to be a ton of cuts priced between uh, that moment, December 23 and December 24. Those cuts are now being taken off, right? Gradually aligning with the dots of the Fed. Then 25 sees more cuts. Also, those are being taken off, basically, right? Aligning again back to the Fed dot plot. And after that, we have some gradual cuts, and then we basically stabilize around 4%. That's what the bond market is pricing today, which is basically in line with what the Fed is telling you, mm -hmm. pretty much. Okay, good. So can you be more bearish than that? Yes, you can. Um, there are still 50, 75 basis points of cuts price for next year, and say you get no cuts, nothing. The Fed doesn't need to cut. You get no recession, nothing. 
Same goes for 25. So you're taking off about 75, 100 basis point of cuts and you are translating that into the curve. So you are basically in the first part of the curve, pushing those bond deals higher, right? Then let's say that by doing that, you're increasing the chances that something goes wrong at some point. So later on in 25, 26, you put up some cuts. Let's say that all in all, they're worth about 25, 30 basis points transferred in the first leg, right? Some... Well, 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 first leg, what part of the curve? The two years? Yeah, yeah. So the first part of the curve goes between zero and two years. Then the second part goes between two and five. Okay. So in the zero to two years, you can't take off all the cuts. There will always be a little bit of insurance premium priced in markets. But say, Jack, that we cancel off another 25, 30, 40 basis point of cuts for the first part of the, of the curve, okay? From zero to two years. If now we have 100 plus basis point, of cuts priced in, say instead we make that only 50 basis points. So 50 basis points gets cut off, let's put a duration of four on that. Yeah. So that's 2% loss. Yeah, something like that. And you're getting paid 5.3, 5, 5.4% 5. now. But now. It's pretty good. Yeah, that's not too bad. But now, go and move that to the fact that if you price away cuts, let's say, from the very front end, you might add some more in 26, 27, 28. Let's say, let's say we square to a loss of 2 to 3%, basically, in the first um, five years of that lag, roughly. Make it 4%. You're basically getting paid back by the coupon you're yeah, locking in, yeah. right? Roughly around, roughly around that. Okay, so what is the risk here? The risk in owning long bonds at these levels is not that the Fed is going to hike one time more or these hikes might be, these cuts might be pushed a little bit down there in the future. The real risk is called term premium. And term premium is effectively the uncertainty around the future growth and inflation that makes the investors be more wary into buying 30-year bond yields rather than just buying three-month T-bills and rolling them for the next 30 years. So if I need to do fixed income, right, and I'm an investor, I can get exposure two ways. I can buy a 10-year bond, 30-year bond today, or I can take my three-month T-bills and roll them over every three months mm -hmm. for the next 10 years or the next 30 years. The difference? Well, interest rate risk. By buying a 10-year bond or a 30-year bond, I'm buying the ton of duration risk. And if I am wrong, I will lose a lot of money. So I have to face volatility, right? So term premium has been negative for a while. I believe it's now positive. Why was it negative for so long? When inflation and growth were very high last year, why was term premium so negative? That was, with hindsight, it was wrong. Basically, the market was saying this is a very short-term spike in, in growth and inflation. It's going to reverse away. We'll ignore it as a blip and we'll immediately go back to the previous assessment of the economy, which is disinflationary, Goldilocks, we grow 2%, inflation is 1.5%. So bonds retain an incredible hedging property for portfolios in a disinflation. If equities draw down, if credit draws down, the Fed is going to pivot, bonds will rally immediately. Right, And so bonds have this nice property, which means pension funds, asset managers, insurance companies, banks, they want bonds in their portfolio. They're even happy to pay up for bonds to gather these coupons, but also have this edging property in portfolios. If you move to a world which is more uncertain, where you don't know whether growth and inflation are going to be back in Goldilocks, but maybe you're going to have periods of boom and bust of growth and inflation. There's going to be more volatility, in other words, around macro cycles. Term premium can't be negative anymore, Jack. If you as an investor are have to choose between buying 30-year bonds or rolling three-month T-bills, you actually want to be compensated, have positive term premium. You want to be slightly compensated for the risk you're taking of the uncertainty ahead for the growth and inflation cycles. That is really the determinant that will drive your potential risk in being long bonds now. If the market thinks that the probability we are going back to the pre-pandemic mm -hmm. environment is lower, term premium has to be higher to compensate you for that risk, which means bond deals will move higher and will move higher at the long end of the curve, which will hurt your P&L more importantly because Term premium affects the long end of the curve more than it does the short end, which means also the reverberation on your PL are going to be more negative. So you really have to ask yourself, how much do I think this time is different? Because that is the main determinant 
of the risk you have right now in buying long bonds at 475%. What do you think is your sort of 95% confidence interval of the top in yields? Like, and for example, the reason I ask is because if you think it's 100 more basis points, so now it's 4.7%, if you think the 10 year, there's a 95% chance that the peak in yields is going to be 5.7%, that's a 100 basis points increase uh, with the duration of what, seven or eight years on the 10 year? I, you, I don't know, but that's an 8% loss but then you're, you're making more than that in two years. It's not super risky. And, you know, if the recession finally comes, which has, you know, been very, very delayed, and it's possible it might not come at all, but, you know, I mean, price of oil is going up, interest rates are going up, then it, you get that more convexity. So I feel like in, in every way, bonds are more attractive now than they were a year ago. With the benefit of hindsight, which, as you said, it's always obvious with the benefits of hindsight. Yeah, I think that's the correct assessment that also professional investors do. They think in terms of probability. So they think in risk and reward. And so with the 475% starting yield on 30-year bonds, you ask yourself, okay, what is my negative tail? Like what can go really wrong, my 95% confidence interval or my 5% tail really? So what can go really wrong that will make me lose money? In in a big way, that will make my risk-reward negative and really you know, it's only about uh, term premium here because if you look at the state and the direction of the labor market and inflation, it is hard to in, to really paint a picture of accelerating growth and accelerating inflation. Yeah. You have an economy which is decelerating. If you take the um, NBER gauge of growth in the US, so I reconstructed that index because. You know, GDP has its own flaws and uh, the labor market has its own flaws, a single measure of whether the U.S. economy is doing. I ask myself, who's, what's the official body that determines whether the U.S. is in a recession or not? It's the NBER. So let's go have a look at what the NBER is looking at to determine whether the U.S. is in a recession or not. And it comes up that they're looking at seven different indicators. And it's a very broad index that you can rebuild. They look at labor market, they look at services, they look at consumption, they look at manufacturing, they look at a bunch of stuff, okay? So I just put them back up in an index. And right now, it's tracking the U.S. economy to be growing below 1% real growth annualized. Is that a recession? No. Recession is below zero for a consistent period of time. Is that a strong economy? Not really. Potential growth in the U.S. is 175%. So we are way below potential, and we are coming down also at a, at a quite stable pace. But normally it's still pretty hot, even though it's not a boom because it's 1% real growth yeah. adjusted for inflation. But if we have 4% inflation, 5% nominal growth, yeah. that's not a recession. So indeed. So that's the other thing. If you look at core inflation, it's annualizing at around 3.5%, plus just below 1% growth, it makes you nominal still above 4 and nominal above four is not recessionary. To get recessions generally, you, get, you need to get nominal trending below two and going down. The direction of travel, though, is definitely for a weaker economy. So you are looking at that, and you are looking at the front end of the bond market basically aligning with the Fed dots. So you are not going to get a lot of headwinds from the cycle, you can only get a lot of headwinds from the term premium, from the uncertainty about the future, from whether people think that inflation is going to remain sticky over time and it's going to be volatile and growth cycles are going to be more boom and bust because we're going to use the fiscal lever much more aggressively. And because we have demographics, which is changing, all of this goes into the uncertainty part. And that's really term premium. And that's really what can drive your negative risk there. Now, Term premium was deeply negative, and it's now back into a positive environment. So it's just mildly positive. Can it be more positive than that? Yes, it can. How meaningfully positive? Well, it will just depend from the narrative. And the longer, actually, Jack, the longer it takes for a recession to unfold, the more likely is that more people will be thinking this time is different. And as they keep thinking that, the term premium moves a little bit higher, Price is validating the narrative. Bond yields are moving higher. Oh, really, this time is different. You get the front page of the economist telling you this time is different or something yep, along yep. these lines. And probably that will be the moment that gets you closer to the peak in yields. But as my mentor used to say, peaks and bottoms are for fools and liars. So it's very hard for me to say where the peak will be. Mm-hmm. 
but an assessment of risk reward where we stand today, I agree with you, should make you more bullish bonds than somebody was nine or 12 months ago. Thank you. Last time we spoke, we spoke twice this year, uh, you definitely were underweight equities. I don't know if you were outright bearish or willing to short stocks, but I think based on our conversation at lunch that you are now, qu- it's quite a confident call that, uh, to, sh- to short equities as a trade, not obviously long-term stocks you know, do well. But uh, tell, us, tell us about that and why. So if you think about the tilts that you want to apply to a well-balanced portfolio, you have in a well-balanced portfolio, you have several assets. And I'm going to disappoint a few people, but they're not only U.S. bonds and U.S. stocks. If you want to have a truly diversified macro portfolio, you need to have internationally diversified equities. You need to have bonds, and then you need to have commodities, and then you need to have the dollar as well, which is a very underappreciated asset, but it serves as a good hedge for certain macro periods. So now, if you look at those four assets right now, and you want to apply macro deals to your portfolio, right? You want to say, where am I supposed to be a bit more long or a bit more short than my normal allocation? I would say that the, the, the highest conviction macro deal that I have right now is not necessarily to be long bonds, but it's to be short certain equities. For certain equities, I mean European equities and small cap US equities. Those are the two sectors or two countries where I feel the most comfortable being short. So let's start from the US small cap. You're looking at companies that have a high leverage, um, a 5X net debt to EBITDA ratio on average for US small caps. You're looking at companies that are unprofitable for the most. And you're looking at- Much, much more unprofitable than companies that are in the S&P 500. Oh yes, by by far, by far. I I don't know if a majority of companies in the Russell are are unprofitable, but uh, far more, Co- co- unprofitable companies are in the Russell than the S&P 500. That is for sure. The S&P 500, you know, it's got very high quality companies. Obviously, it's got some not quality companies, but it's got some very high quality companies. And, you know, people post a chart of, I'm sure you've seen this, like the uh, the NASDAQ, to, which has, you know, NVIDIA and Apple, and Microsoft, relative to the Russell 2000. And they say, oh, this ratio is at a 20-year low. Sure. It's like, yeah, well, a lot of the companies in the Russell 2000 are crappy. Right. And a lot of the companies in the NASDAQ are superb. Correct. So, so Russell, people, you should do that just for that. Yeah. So the Russell 2000 needs two things to do really well. Strong nominal growth trending higher and possibly low cost of capital at the same time. So low interest mm-hmm. rates. When you get a combination of both, the Russell goes to the roof because the tailwinds of nominal growth transfer into higher earnings for companies that are normally unprofitable. So they benefit a lot from that. And on top of it, their cost of capital comes down because interest rates are low. And so their leverage is really not a problem anymore. It actually even becomes a tailwind if it can be achieved at very low yep. borrowing rates. That's the environment of the first half of 2021. Reopenings, fiscal stimulus, nominal growth through the roof, borrowing rates still very low. We talked about you know, uh, 30-year uh, rates being below 2% back then. In that environment, the Russell does pretty well. But now reverse the environment today and you have nominal growth trending down below potential and trending down. And the cost of leverage is damn elevated in the United States, but everywhere else in the world. So this combination is pretty toxic for small cap, often unprofitable. And they, were, they had a shorter duration of liabilities. The US compared to Europe had very long duration, but it was, you know, Amazon, I remember this headline, Bloomer headline of 2020, issued a 40-year bond. Yeah. A lot of the you know, not-so-high-quality companies in the Russell, they didn't issue a 40-year bond. They you know, borrowed from banks or they had a floating rate obligation, so they're much more exposed to higher interest rates. Actually, there is also a chart we can put up that shows yep. the, yeah. the tenor of the high-yield issuance, which is not necessarily a reflection of the Russell, but high-yield is below investment grade rated. It's lower-quality companies. They have actually lowered the duration of their borrowing rather than increase them. So they're actually choosing to effectively shorten the duration of their borrowing. They haven't really gotten a lot of tailwinds from lengthening their borrowing uh, window like Amazon did, for example. So they're facing a very nasty situation. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's one of the macro tails I want to apply. The other vulnerability is really, I think, in Europe. Because if we look at Europe and let's go back and discuss the macro lags, right? I mean, they depended on a couple of things. Floating rate obligations, mortgages and corporate borrowing, uh, and refinancing cliffs, mostly, right? So Europe, 
European corporates, triple B rated, so low investment grade, European corporates could borrow for 10 years fixed in the years of QE between 2014 and 2019 and an all in interest rates of one and a half percent. Really? I, wow, I did not know that. There is a chapter where we can pull it up. It's ridiculous. One and a half percent fixed borrowing for 10 years for a triple B rated corporate. A lot of business models look great if you apply that cost of borrowing, right? You want to know today what that rate is? 425%. It's triple. It's literally triple. So the increase in cost of borrowing has been massive. That's a result, both of the European Central Bank moving from negative rates to 4% deposit rates, and also credit spreads being a bit wider in Europe. They were really compressed because of ongoing big quantitative easing that we had between 2014 and 2019. Now they've widened up a bit. So that change in corporate borrowing in Europe is really, really aggressive. On top of it, the European private sector borrowing structure is more tilted towards floating rates. In certain jurisdictions, especially in Northern Europe, in the Baltic countries in particular, there is quite a lot of the mortgage uh, market which is floating. That means the ECB rate hikes are getting transferred now, Jack. Not in 12 months, not in two years when uh, households need to refinance. It's now. They're already feeling it. So a lot of your disposable income gets basically taken away by a higher mortgage installment that you're forced to pay now. And what, so Europe is more vulnerable to higher interest rates and more vulnerable at a faster pace, unlike the US where, you know, so many homeowners locked in 2.5% for the next 30 years. Tell us, you know, I, I don't, I haven't been following European uh, economic news as close as I should have, but I've seen a few folks talking about Germany PMIs and just the very weak economic data from Germany. Would you say Germany is, is in a recession, close to a recession? And how, what other standouts, you know, pick wherever you want in the Euro area are, I mean, how bad, how bad is it in Europe right now? Well, Europe, uh, Germany is already in a recession. It um, is. Broad, broadly speaking, yeah. yes, I mean, manufacturing is dead, but <laughs> that's the case for a year and a half or two. Uh, services, are, uh, PMIs are also consistent with the recession right now in Germany. Not a very deep one, but given the fact that the macro lags are about to kick in faster and you start from a point where Germany is already in a recession, I think the outlook isn't particularly rosy. And if you look at other countries as well and you include everything the, in the, into a Eurozone services PMI kind of gauge to get you an idea of where is the Eurozone economy overall, it's basically flirting already as we speak with the recession. So your starting point is pretty weak and much weaker than the United States. And the vulnerabilities are much more evident, both for the floating rate part, but also most importantly, and we should put up a chart now, for the refinancing cliff story. So I, I had a look at different jurisdictions, US, Canada, UK, Europe, Australia, and I looked at their corporate borrowing market. And I looked at how much of that corporate borrowing was coming due for refinancing in 2023, in the first half of 2024, second half, and then in 2025 and 2026. Now, the refinancing cliffs are getting more acute wherever you look at in 2024, 2025, and 2026. So gradually, tighter, higher for longer, tighter policy is going to hurt a larger portion of the private sector over time. As refinancing cliffs come due, refinancing bills come due, more corporates will feel the heat over time. But in Europe, this process isn't gradual, Jack. It's much more sudden. So you can see from the chart, while in, in January, in, the, in, in six months of the year, you would expect about 7 to 8% of your entire refinancing to come due, Europe has doubled the amount coming due in the first half of 2024. So as a recap, you have a place where you start from a, basically from a recession as your starting point already, or extremely weak growth to start with. You have more floating rate obligations from the private sector. That means you're feeling already the tightening more. Refinancing cliffs are coming fast and furious compared to anywhere else you look at. So the higher interest rates, that 425% corporate borrowing rate we discussed instead of the one and a half corporates are used to in Europe is coming to bite now in the next six to nine months. So you can't kick the can down the road as a corporate anymore. You have to decide. You know, your budget gets more allocated to paying your bills when it comes to interest rate expenses. It means you'll have to hire less or even fire some more people. And that process happens now. It can't be delayed anymore. Fourth, oil prices. 
Europe is a net energy importer. So when you get these oil prices and these gasoline spreads and, you know, you get price at the pump for European consumers being much higher, that has a disproportionately big impact on Europe compared to the US, for example. And then I look at the euro stocks and then I look at equity markets and credit spreads in Europe. Pretty much relaxed. Europe was one of the darling of the value story that basically was rampant between April and August, where you had Japanese value stocks and equity markets going up and Europe and Poland. I was long Poland. It went incredibly fast, incredibly well. Europe was the darling of that value story where we said, hey, look at this. You know, the dollar is depreciating. The economy isn't in a recession. This banking crisis was not a crisis, actually. And inflation is coming down and growth is coming down. This is Goldilocks. So the dollar will depreciate and we're going to buy any other asset that has a story behind. Oh, it's European bank stocks or value or it's Poland or it's Japan. Europe was at the epicenter of these buying flows, right? That means the performance over the last year or year to date still looks pretty rosy against the backdrop I just discussed, which I think is actually pretty negative. So in a macro portfolio, I would really be more conservative when it comes to um, developed market equities, UK, Europe, uh, that are not the US. Mm -hmm. And in the US, particularly small cap companies, I think are really vulnerable now. So if you're looking to be underweight something or shorted, it would be European equities and small cap stocks, not Apple, Microsoft. No. Yeah. Well, of course, if we get a proper drawdown, a proper credit stress, exactly like at the end of 2018, I mean, Apple drew down 25% in six weeks. They're not going to be immune. But I think, again, risk reward, yeah. I think small caps and European equities are looking particularly vulnerable. If you're looking for places to belong to offset that short, well, as I said, the dollar is a great diversifier in a uh, balanced macro portfolio. Have a look at the last one to two months, bonds are going down, stocks are going down, commodities X oil are also going down, oil is doing okay, so good diversifier. The other clear diversifier is the dollar. The dollar has been performing extremely well against the euro and the Japanese yen, which account for 75% of DXY anyway. And why is that? Well, I think a couple of reasons. The first is if we are in a fight to apply higher for longer, in all bond markets in the world, because that's happening. Also, European bond markets are applying the very same playbook. The European curve has been very steepening as well over the last two months, right? But if we are in a fight to apply higher for longer, which is the economy, which is the best equipped to sustain that higher for longer, fundamentally, that's the United States amongst developed markets. So that means that the curve can bear steep and more aggressive in the US. So interest rate differentials will normally favor the dollar. So the dollar performs well. And also it's, it's, a, it's a positive carry trade, right? If you're long the dollar and short the Japanese yen and short the euro, we're earning carry to ride this bear steepening trend, which is dominated by the US in the first place. And second, the world is leveraged in dollars. The world is a place where we have $12 trillion of dollar-denominated debt issued outside the United States. I mean, if interest rates move higher and the Fed is tightening, the Fed is removing liquidity from the system, it's going to be increasingly hard for a Brazilian corporate, uh, a Chinese corporate to easily refinance those dollar-denominated liabilities. So that's going to lead to a, uh, an aggressive bid for spot dollars to be able really to refinance these liabilities. It's basically a deleveraging mechanism. Once debt and leveraging dollar becomes more expensive and the economy is slowing down at the same time, the dollar will get stronger because people will rush to it in order to get their hands on dollars they need to refinance their dollar liabilities. It's like a deflating, deleveraging balloon that also helps the dollar being supported. So I think the dollar in general is a good diversifier to have in the portfolio in this part of the cycle, exactly like in late 2018. It's a good asset to have. And guys, I mean, dollar cash risk-free, it's 5.25%. So that's not too bad. Either. So you like cash? Uh, like dollar cash? Look, for a US investor, this is interesting because if you just buy T-bills, you are not getting exposure to a, an active long dollar position. You're getting cash. You're getting paid risk-free in your base currency, 5.25%. 
But if the dollar appreciates against the euro, are you making money? No. You're just long T-bills. So you want to borrow the euros to buy T-bills, borrow the yen. I mean, you can do UUP. Like the UUP ETF is basically an ETF that gets you to borrow, implicitly borrow euro, yen, and whatever it's in the DXY and buy dollars with it. So that gets you really exposed to the FX position to the dollar. I think the dollar has rallied a lot yeah. now. So the, again, the risk reward of that decision isn't as good as it was three months ago, but I'm mentioning it because the dollar is a good diversifier in a macro portfolio. Right now, I think just cash at 525% gets you a, a rate of return, which is pretty hard to beat. If I look at all the global macro hedge funds, my clients, but also you can just check any index that gathers global macro hedge funds. This year, you know, they are anywhere between minus two and plus two percent. It's been a pretty difficult year for global macro hedge funds. Cash is returning over five. That makes the hurdle for any investment you consider pretty difficult to beat. Right. All right. So I, we promised the bond nerds, if, you know, 20 minutes ago, we'd, we'd uh, get into the weeds. Let's talk about the bear steepening. Sure. Uh, just, I'll, I'll give a simple explanation. You can, you can expand upon it. Uh, but steepening is when the uh, y- y- the yield curve go- becomes more upward sloping in net position. So bear steepening is when there's a sell-off, bear markets, and uh, long-end yields rise more than short-end yields rise. And then a bull steepening is when long-end yields fall by less than short-end yields fall. I, I think I, I said that uh, uh, correctly. Bull steepening is, typic- is much more complex common than bear steepening. And Correct. my reading of yield curve history is that it is bull steepening that precedes very dangerous scenarios, such as because because the market's pricing in the Federal Reserve will cut. And uh, th- that is that the, the central bank is going to cut when there's trouble in the economy. Bear steepening is much more rare. And we're having bear steepening right now. So I, I think you've been talking about how the bear, bear steepener is rare and dangerous. And I obviously will agree it's just factual that it is rare. But when you say it is dangerous, tell us what uh, analogs go go back and yeah. how does that compare to a, a bull steepener? Okay. So if we can pull up your yep. chart uh, here on the screen, it's pretty easy to visualize what a bear steepening means, right? You have two curves here. And those are market implied Fed funds path. So this is what the market is placing Fed funds to be for the next 10 years, for example, right? You'll have a curve that is pre-bear steepening and a curve that is post-bear steepening. And in the bottom part of the chart, you have the delta. So what happens at each tenor during the bear steepening? It's pretty easy to understand that the front end of bond markets during the bear steepening price is a bit more hikes, right? So it maybe can be 10 basis point, 15 basis point of more hikes or less cuts. That's the same story. So basically, it moves up a tiny bit, right? But the difference compared to the regime we have seen prevailing in 2022, which was bear flattening, is that back then, if you priced more hikes in the next one year, the market immediately later on was pricing more cuts to go, um, Jack. So basically the idea was, yeah, you can hike now, Mr. Powell. I believe you, you're going to be hiking. You talk like you're Volcker, mm-hmm. but as you hike now, I'll be pricing more cuts immediately thereafter. And so the curve bear flattened. What is, sorry, what, what, when was this? 2022. 2022, yep, yep. Right? So the curve was bear flattening. Yep. The front end was going up very, very rapidly in yields, but then five-year rates were going up less and 10-year rates were going up even less. And, and so the, sp- the spread uh, between the, the tenure, two-year, two-year tenure, uh, narrowed so much so that it became negative, but we have an inverted curve. And Correct. that's another thing. Now we have a bear steepener during an inverted curve, curve, which is exceptionally rare. Yeah, it's really, really rare. So this was 2022. And now instead, look at the chart. What's happening is that the market is pricing a bit more of a hawkish Fed in 2023, in 2024. It's pricing away cuts. So you have this delta being a little bit positive in the first part of the chart. But bear steepening means that this is sustained in the long end of the bond curve. So that means that more hikes today or less cuts or anyway, a tighter Fed in 2023, 2024, 2025 is not going to lead to more cuts down the road. What this means is the bond market telling you, Mr. Fed, I believe you, you won't cut in 2024 and 2025, but I also don't think that this will translate into a weaker economy going forward. This is the bond market telling us that neutral rates are higher, that the economy can handle less cuts, that the economy won't see a recession, the economy won't need all the cuts we thought, 
but that the economy can sustain this tighter Fed for longer. This is what a bear steepening really tells you. And I think that on average, it's definitely uh, so, someone who would sell bonds would think that way, and someone who would buy thought bonds would think the opposite way. But how much of it is just the term premium going from negative to positive? And I guess the answer is, or, or what I'm trying to you know, get at, is just the huge amount of supply. The, you have a government uh, uh, de- debt ceiling showdown earlier this year. Treasury was not refilling its coffers. Uh, it was very close to running out of money. Now it's issuing a huge amount of paper, of, of treasury bonds. And particularly, it's now issuing a lot of coupons. So it's been flooding the market with supply. And then you know, we have long end going up. How much Do you see a correlation between that? Uh, no. No, not at all. Uh, insignificant. Insignificant, okay. in, in the big scheme of things. So I've been in bond markets. I've been a big institutional player. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the pattern of higher supply, lower supply, and what happens at auctions when there is a higher supply. So the market is obviously, as any markets, a market of supply and demand. Pretty clear. The argument of supply is very easy to make because supply is immediately measurable. You can just go on the Treasury website and you can get a calendar of how many coupons are going to be issuing. And you know you, you can measure it. It's very simple. It's crystalline. So it's all, all very often used as an argument to be long bond or short bond. Supply is picking up, supply is going down, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is pretty superficial because it ignores the other side of the equation, which is demand. Problem with demand is it is much more difficult to measure, Jack. And so right now in, in demand, we have one negative, which is global central banks, foreign exchange reserve managers. They have been buying less treasuries. That's been going on for a couple of years now, since the the sanctions on Russia, effectively. You have had central banks turning a bit more into gold on average, but a bit further away from treasuries than they were before. FX reserve managers are about a $12 trillion worth market. So it's not small, it's pretty significant. And about 60% of that is invested in treasuries. So we're talking a six to seven trillion worth stock buyer of treasuries over time, right? So they matter. If they buy less, they matter. But I'm now saying supply and central banks affects reserve managers as buyers. Those are the two most commonly used references to talk about that. We are ignoring by far the largest buyers in the market. Banks, pension funds, insurance companies, asset managers. Those are a magnitude that goes between five and 10 times the effects reserve managers in general. So banks are... Um, forced buyers of treasuries effectively because of regulation. They have to own a certain amount of their balance sheet into high quality liquid asset. That certain amount is roughly 12 to 15% of their balance sheet, so a significant amount. And high quality liquid assets can be bank reserves at the Fed, treasuries, mortgage backed securities, uh, some corporate bonds as well, but we're talking about a minor percentage of those. Okay, so treasuries represent the biggest part of this significant pile of the balance sheet of U.S. banks? I don't know. I, I think that it, they buy a lot of agency securities because they have the spread. That's correct. But yeah, yeah. But tre- they're very similar. They're very similar. Treasuries would generally represent half, at least yeah. half of this HQLA portfolio. So we're talking about 6 or 7% of any U.S. bank balance sheet and the aggregate balance sheet of U.S. banks is extremely large. But they bought it all in 2020 and 2021. And this is, you know, anecdotal one data point, but it really speaks to, I mean, Bank of America owns over half a trillion dollars worth of treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. And that position, you know, their their lost position was over $100 billion unrealized, a lot of it unrealized, and now it's surely larger. I think a lot of banks are tapped out. Now, of course, banks are going to be buying, I mean, sure, I'm sure today, tens of billions of Bonds were bought by banks, or you know, many billions of dollars of banks uh, bought by banks. But I think that uh, they bought a lot in 2020 and 2021, and their balance sheets are shrinking. So I don't know what so how much capacity they so they have. The main and, and, and sorry, also you know, Alf, having you you worked uh, at a bank in this position that we're talking about, you know, you know that when when, when it, a, a bond yielding one percent that has a future return path that's very negative, it's you know, it's not going to do well. A, a bank can buy that because they need to buy it for regulatory reasons or because, you know, uh, 
it's it the, the person doing it isn't going to get fired for buying a lot. Likewise, when bonds right now, I mean, let's just presume maybe it's not the case, but a 4.7 percent, you know, treasury yield is it's pretty good. Definitely a lot better than one percent. You know, banks can buy bonds when they're unattractive, and they can be selling bonds or not buying bonds when they are attractive. Yeah. Well, look, um, a few comments. The first is any prudent bank would buy most of their treasuries hedged from an interest rate perspective. So they will attach a swap to the treasuries they're buying. For, for held maturity? Or? No, that would be yeah. for available for sale. In, the, in Europe is different, but in the US there are special accounting rules that basically skew you towards hedging a certain portion of your treasuries and not hedging a certain portion, depending on which accounting category you classify them. Mm-hmm. But any prudent bank would hedge a very good portion of their treasuries that they buy. So that means that the yield at which they buy it doesn't really make a lot of difference. They're so-called price insensitive buyers of treasuries. So they would buy because they need to have a certain portion of their balance sheet into liquid assets, okay? And treasuries qualify as liquid assets and they make more money than reserves. So it's a good asset to have. They're super liquid. They can be posted at the Fed. They can be posted in repo, great. When they buy, generally they would edge the interest rate risk. So whether they buy at 1% yield or at 5% yield, if they pay a swap against it, it doesn't really matter if you're following me. I'm following you. I just don't, like my reading of U.S. banks, I feel like often, so that would imply that U.S. banks are, would have been net uh, receivers of floating swap, floating rates, but they're, but they're not. Net they're payers of floating rates. They buy a bond yeah. and that's when they receive fixed coupons Mm -hmm. and to hedge interest rate risk you pay fixed coupons against those yes okay okay yeah yeah now we're getting very technical but my point is banks are price insensitive buyers of treasuries pretty much okay so that means that whatever the level is they have a certain amount of balance sheet capacity that they need to deploy in treasuries they will buy with a certain maturity and generally they will buy five, seven years, 10 years treasuries. That's generally the sweet spot. And generally, they would hedge interest rate risk. That means that every year, they will have about 15 to 20% of their treasury book coming due, maturing, right? So that means they have to reinvest those. They have these treasuries maturing. They have to redeploy them in the market. They will just buy again more treasuries and hedge the interest rate risk. This is the normal pattern, okay? They are so-called regulatory-driven, price-insensitive buyers. When you look at demand, you need to ask yourself, what are banks doing? Are more treasuries maturing? Are they buying those treasuries to replace the treasuries that are maturing? What about the entire balance sheet? Is it shrinking or is it becoming bigger? And then I think you have a point because now it is shrinking. Deposits are flowing away from the banking system. We are going into money market funds or elsewhere. So that means that banks would have maybe organically less demand for treasuries. But I'm saying this because we need to ask ourselves, what about the buyers? Not only what about the seller of treasuries, what about the supply? That's easy to measure, but it locks the depth of the other analysis. What are, what, what are pension funds doing? What are insurance companies doing? When they have a target return of 5 or 7%, and in the past, they used to have to buy private equity or alternative assets or real estate to try and do these returns. Now they can just buy some treasuries or some investment grade credit, and they'll pretty much hit their target return, effectively taking no equity or credit risk on their balance sheet. So a higher level of bond deals attracts these investors, which anyway need treasuries to hedge their long-dated liabilities because an insurance company has life insurances. Those are long-duration liabilities. A pension fund will need to pay pension premiums in 40 years. That's a long-dated liability. To match these long-dated liabilities, they need long-dated assets in the first place. That's why they're in the business of swaps, of buying long-dated treasuries, for example. So they are buyers anyway. They're sticky structural buyers. If bond yields are 5%, they can just buy those, meet their hedging requirements of long-dated liabilities, and on top, get closer to their target return without having to pile up in real estate or equities or private credit. That's very attractive for them. So are pension funds buying more? Yep. Maybe yes. Yep. But the reason why I am putting out this for you is when I get asked about supply, it's a very easy thing to measure. But what about demand? You got you to take in demand as well, for, for sure. So the, the pension fund, that makes a lot of uh, sense to me because 
you know, I remember in 2021, fundamentally a horrible environment for bonds. Uh, and, you know, of course, like you know, most people, I got pretty bearish on bonds and just after the, you know, in February, but from February to September, when you conducted the poll or, or about there, bonds actually rallied. And of course, there's all, once the price action happens, there's always a narrative for it. But the narrative was uh, people, stocks had outperformed bonds by so much in 2020 that they rebalanced out of stocks into bonds. And that makes sense. And that, you know, that has stocks have outperformed stocks of crushed bonds this year. And that, that might, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the leveraged community, I'll just quickly mention this, so you may disagree, uh, you know, borrowing money to buy bonds, that carry trade is a negative carry trade right now. But going back to the banks, this is pretty, pretty, you know, nerdy stuff. But so a bank buys a 10 year treasury bond or a 30 year treasury bond, and you say they hedge that. And so they would hedge that by receiving floating rates. Correct. Banks, Almost every American bank I've seen is a net payer of floating rates, sure. not a net receiver. That makes sense yeah. because the entire balance sheet of a bank yeah. needs to be considered. Yes. I said before, bonds represent about 10 to 15% of the entire balance sheet of a bank. What about the remaining 85%? The remaining 85% on the asset side is made by loans and mortgages mm -hmm. and other assets, which tend to be fixed in nature. And then you have to go and look at the liability side of a bank balance sheet. So they'll have long dated liabilities. They will issue bonds as well themselves, right? To fund. Then they will have deposits. Those are more short dated in nature, right? I mean, somehow they can fly away. As we have seen with SBB, they can fly away very yes. rapidly, but it depends on the nature and the composition of these deposits. So what I'm saying is that in a balance sheet of a bank, there are assets, liabilities. Some of them are floating, some of them are fixed. The bank will have a net resulting interest rate risk from it, and generally, the business of a bank is to borrow short and lend long, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Yes. So when they come up with derivatives, interest rate swaps, to try and hedge this position, they will look at this and they will look at mitigating the risk, basically, the resulting risk of these. And so you can't really focus on one item, which mm -hmm. is the bond portfolio. You need to look at the entire balance sheet of a bank. This is something that struck me during the SBB crisis in March. So the story was... Uh, oh my God, banks are under trouble because interest rates are going up. And interest rates going up is terrible because look at all these unrealized losses. So look at this portion of the balance sheet, 15% of the assets. But it wasn't 15% for SVB. Well, for SVB, it was yeah, much yeah, larger. Yeah. But yeah. I was looking at the overall system. Sure, sure. So the overall system, 15%, because we were discussing the real question was, is this a systemic crisis or is this limited to some banks that are run like from cowboys, which mm -hmm. don't do any risk management, et cetera, or is this a problem for JP Morgan? This was really the existential question back in March. Yeah. People were focusing on a 15% of the balance sheet asset side. Mm -hmm. They were forgetting the remaining 85% of the asset and the 100% of the liabilities as well, because interest rate risk is inherent in a bank balance sheet on the asset side and on the liability side overall, not only on the bond portfolio part. And so JP Morgan runs, for example, but also Citigroup does it, an assessment of what is the interest rate sensitivity of their entire balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So they take their assets, they take their liabilities, they take their interest rate hedging instruments, their derivatives, they put them all up together and they say, what happens to my capital if interest rates go up by 200 basis points? And the answer for JP Morgan was, yeah, my capital gets a little bit of, of uh, it gets hurt, right? A little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my, my capital will go down by 5%. The entire capital of JP Morgan will take a 5% hit. That's it. Economic value of the equity? Yes. Yeah. That would take a 5% hit. So when you look at that, you understand that banks that do proper risk management, not all of them do, yeah. but banks that do proper interest rate risk management won't really get affected much. And coming back to the bond part, it's a bit of the same story, right? They will look at their bond portfolio. They will hedge most of the interest rate risk. If they don't, it's because it's offsetting interest rate risk somewhere else. Okay, so uh, I want, I've want i got a lot to get off my chest. And I want to preamble by saying this. You have real world experience in this rather niche of the financial world. And there are a lot of financial experts on, on TV and who are not on TV who don't have that experience. And I certainly do not have that experience. But I have digged into this a little bit. And I think that uh, this modeling assumptions 
uh, uh, the mo modeling of interest rate risk on the asset side, on the liability side, it depends on a whole series of assumptions, which may or may not be true. Right. And you have to say, what is the, these implied assumptions, how do they compare to what actually happened over the past two or three years? So you said that 50% uh, is the securities books for, for treasuries on the asset side, but also it's it's a lot of loans and a lot of you know, US huge mortgage industry. And, uh, and uh, when those mortgages were made or refied, refinanced in 2020, there was uh, assumptions about how long those loans would stay on their books. Uh, I think they, you know, a, a mortgage-backed security index or ETF had a duration as low as three or even two in 2020. Obviously, it's different in, in Europe where, where you worked for, for I'm sure. Um, and now that duration is seven. You know, people, the CPRs, like conditional prepayment rates were at 40%. Mm -hmm. They bottomed in March of 2023, interestingly, when SVB failed and they owned a lot of mortgages at three. Uh, and so a lot of assumptions, oh, we can make variable rate loans. Uh, and so, so we're, very, we're very asset sensitive. We're going to make money when interest rates rise because we'll make money at all these higher loan, loan yields and our interest costs are going to, interest costs are going to win, win very low as they did from you know, 2015 to 2018 when it was a very slow hiking cycle. This was a very dramatic uh, uh, hiking cycle. So there, I think there were, there were professional people who made, based on historical track records, uh, what has happened previously, uh, a lot of assumptions that just did not play out to be. So, so I would say the U.S. banking system, I, I'd say I'm, I'm actually kind of a little bit more uh, constructive on the credit. I think like a lot of credit is I mean, performing, but I mean, when it comes to there's a duration problem within the banking sector and that that was front and center with uh, um, Silicon Valley Bank. So I, 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 I think the, uh, the U.S. banking system is a lot more long duration than they uh, than, than they have been historically, I would say. Uh, I think that is correct as an assessment um, that will probably require them to do some more derivatives hedging. I mean, as you said, most of this is assumptions. It's like, okay, what is the prepayment that is going to get done on these mortgage-backed securities? Well, it's generally... Con um, depends on interest rates, right? I mean, if interest rates are coming down very aggressively, more people will repay. This will shorten the duration of these mortgage-backed securities. What if interest rates go up all of a sudden? You have to change your assumptions. On the deposit side, it's even more volatile. How do you know what is your average lifespan of your deposits? Is it one year, three year, four, five years? Yeah. How often do people roll their deposits? All of these are assumptions, yes. right, which are baked into the cake. Good risk management from banks generally requires the ability to adapt, understand the convexity of these assumptions, when they can go wrong, when they can go right, and adapt and do risk management flexibly. I'm in no position to judge whether any bank is doing that correctly. Yeah. We, we saw that some banks are doing it very poorly, that's for sure. Right. Well, with the benefit of hindsight, again, a, a you know, surge in interest rates of 525 basis points, no one was you know, properly hedge. I mean, I think JP Morgan did a phenomenal job compared yeah. to you know, a lot of other banks. And some, some banks have good you know, models where they basically, their cost of deposits is uh, uh, still zero. But in the same way, like if your portfolio, if you were burning, uh, you know, if 30% if of your portfolio, your 70% stocks, 30% VIX futures, mm -hmm. long-term, that is a horrible, you're way overhead. You're going to be losing, yeah. burning premium every time. But if you did that in February of 2020, obviously you're a genius, you know? Yes. So, oh, now everyone who you know, did things professionally and buy the book and they only owned 50 basis points worth of uh, VIX futures, they look like they were bad, you know? So I think, um, yeah, I think this huge interest rate risk shock has, has like affected bank balance sheets in a non-linear way that I don't, I don't know if they, I, one thing, for example, is like agency mortgage-backed security spreads are insanely high uh, and they have positive convexity now, which I don't know if they've ever had, you know, they're supposed to have negative convexity. So I'm like, if, you know, I'm obviously not an institutional investor, but if I if I were, I would be loading up on it. So I'm like, why are people not buying this incredibly cheap asset relative to treasuries? I mean, I haven't looked into agency MBS for a while. I used to look at it when I was at yeah. my job and now doing broader macro. Yeah. It has become a very niche, niche, niche asset. So I don't have an answer for you, but in general, uh, your take is correct on the fact that many things are really conditional on the path that markets are taking. I mean, you can backtest a strategy that says, hey, I'm going to buy protection from my equity portfolio only when the VIX is below 12 and realized bold is below 10 and the curve is this shape or that shape. You can backtest all of this and you go in the past and you 
create a strategy that with hindsight looks like an exceptional tail risk strategy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. You can do that. Yep. Uh, the reality is that conditions are always changing. And that's the beauty of this. And also what makes it very hard is to be humble enough as an investor to understand that the conditions that have prevailed in the past and that have led to a certain market reaction might not repeat again. You might have the same conditions and a different market reaction. So you always need to be um, humble and flexible. And I think you know, that's a very difficult skill to have as an investor, but it's it's one of the most important ones. Yeah. And, I, you know, I know a few people and I'm sure you know people who uh, you know, manage money for emerging market clients. And I think some of them, I'm just making this assumption, but they're looking at 4.5, 4.7% treasury yields, dollar denominated as just a huge win, like a, a total layup. Yeah. So... So you're, you're, you're right about, I, I mean, it's, it's more attractive. 4.5 is more attractive than 3.5, which is more attractive than one. Again, with the, this is with the set of information that we yeah. have today. And we discussed about the risk and the reward of the trade. And the best you can do is keep yourself grounded, analyze the data, hopefully without a bias, which is impossible because any of us has biases. It's in the human nature to be tilted towards a certain outcome. You know, it's a bias. The important part is to recognize them, is to say, okay, well, I am biased to be a long-term bond bull. I am biased to be a guy that thinks that the U.S. will always dominate and emerging market equities are irrelevant. They don't matter. Whatever is your bias, okay? You think gold is going to go to $3,000. Whatever is your bias. The important part is to recognize it because you often are going to get tilted to that. And instead, you're supposed to be able to analyze new incoming data from a relatively rational standpoint. And uh, my mentor and also my experience taught me that one of the best ways to do that is tactically speaking, very often to not have a position. Mm -hmm. People itch, they find this very hard, but no position is a great position because it reduces your bias massively. When you have a position on, you'll find yourself more likely to read material that validates yeah, your position, yeah. right? Read people agree with that. You comment them on Twitter, yeah, man, I agree with you. And if someone disagrees with this guy, he's, he's he so dumb. Yeah. He doesn't get it. He's so <laughs> dumb, but he doesn't get it. So no position instead puts you in a great position because you can assess incoming data in a, in a more rational way and make this risk-reward assessment better. And at the end, this is a game where you need to accept you're going to be wrong very often. I am wrong a lot of times. And, uh, you know, just recognize your bias and be humble. And uh, we talked about rates at 475% rationally, I can make a story for which yields at 475% from a risk-reward perspective, they deserve a solid position in a long-term portfolio. Might be that in six months, I'm proven wrong. So I need to be able to also cater for that outcome. And that, that is very hard for a lot of people. Yeah, well, you, you said you can make a case why it's good in a long-term portfolio. I would say if bonds sell off, the, the 30-year goes to 5.25%. You wouldn't have been proven wrong on the long-term portfolio. You know, I'm a young person, and it's people who are watching us who are young people. You definitely should be, you know, massively overweight equities. And I don't know, if, you know, if bonds should play a role at all. If you're, you know, my age, I'm not going to say say what my age is. But uh, you know, I mean, bonds at 4.75 percent, and the slowdown has not occurred yet. I mean, it's, uh, you know, tactically, it's it's just getting a little a little interesting. I want let's all right, we we still got to deliver on the. Uh, the bear steepening the uh, um, uh, uh, nerd play because this is exceptionally rare where bear steepening is occurring during an inverted yield curve. Yeah. The twenty to twenty uh, eighteen scenario you said wasn't during an inverted curve, and the bear steepening it was it was pretty pretty mild. I think you know it was a seventeen basis points in like thirty days. We've done seventeen basis points in a few weeks. This is this is <laughs> extreme. This, this is, is massive. This is historic, and you know I and I had a. I had a, you know, I'm sure a bias of I was, I wanted to look for patterns going through the data, but I looked through the data and I set up some rules and I don't think we've had this kind of flavor since 1981. Yeah. Volker. This is really aggressive. And this is, so in 2018, we had a, a, a miniature version of which, what we are having today, right? So we started from a curve, which was first mildly murdered, then not in murder, then the bear steepening was relatively mild, but it occurred. The level of interest rates was also lower as this mm -hmm. was happening. Today, it's all on steroids, right? Yeah, yeah, we start from an inverted deal curve and the bear steepening is much more aggressive. The rate of change is super, super hard. And so basically, the way you need to look at bear steepening is the following. It's very rare and it's telling you that higher rates over the next 
one to two years are not going to lead to more cuts down the road, that the economy can take it. It's higher for longer. You know, it's sustainable. It's fine. Bear steepening per se is not an issue for markets and the economy if nominal growth is healthy and rising. Why? Because fundamentals are showing you that the economy can handle it. You have this narrative, higher for longer, bear steepening is happening. But if nominal growth is trending up, Jack, and we can put up the chart that shows the bear steepening in 2021. Do you remember when Biden won the Georgia elections? Yeah. Do you remember that? So that cemented Biden's uh, Senate um, majority. And that basically led people to yeah. think, oh, the fiscal stimulus we're doing now is going to be done forever or almost. Yep. And so the curve bear steepened. Bear steepening is normally bullish. Do you remember what happened to stock markets? No, the Russell was yeah, yeah. going through the roof. And only, only I think that was the period when the Russell was outperforming the Nasdaq because you had nominal growth, as you will see in the chart, trending to the upside extremely rapidly. You had fiscal stimulus, reopenings, uh, all at once. The curve was bear steepening, yeah. but the economy was showing you that bear steepening was fundamentally justified. And so the stock market was doing great. And so yeah, bear steepening often occurs right at the beginning of a new economic cycle, right after the Federal Reserve has cut. So right. then the long end sells off and that's boom, it's Goldilocks, 2009, 2021. Now we're looking yeah. at the other side of the bear steepening, which is really rare. And it's happening while nominal growth is trending down. So what that means is the market is pushing this higher for longer narrative. It's getting priced into the bear steepening, but the fundamentals are not justifying the bear steepening. Nominal growth is trending down. So late cycle, not early cycle, but late cycle bear steepening. It's very rare and very dangerous because you're passing through more tightening through the economy at a time when the economy is slowing down. So the combination is generally very toxic. And this combination has, has happened only a few times, really. It generally lasts not a lot, maybe a few months at best. In 2018, a couple of months of mild bear steepening while the economy was decelerating. But the curve wasn't inverted. But the curve wasn't inverted. was enough to freeze the credit markets in November and then the equity markets in December. In 2007, you had the longest Fed pause on record between April 2006, if my memory doesn't play games with me, and uh, December of seven, yeah. yeah. I, uh, so it's, it was a long, long pause. But come uh, about late summer 2007, it was 13, 14 months of 5, 25% Fed funds. Fed on pause, core inflation coming down, growth coming down, and still the market was pushing for bear steepening. It took a few months until some cracks starting to occur, right? So that was late 2007, early 2008. So this bear steepening late in the cycle is really, really rare, but also more dangerous because the economy isn't fundamentally justifying the bear steepening. It's actually proving the opposite. But the narrative of wanting to push higher for longer, of people getting tired of waiting for this go-go recession that never shows up, gets priced in, into the bear steepening of the curve while the economy is slowing down. It's a double whammy negative for risk assets and it increases the chance that something goes wrong. That's why I call it a rare and also a pretty dangerous occurrence. Well, I mean, what, do, what do you think happens? If the last time this occurred was 1981, I think in uh, October, I think it was during a recession and pretty soon thereafter, I mean, I think, I think this last time this signal occurred in 1981, it was pretty close to the all time high in interest rates since like 2000 BC in you know, modern day Iraq. Like I so so with a sample size of one, that looks pretty bullish for bonds. Sample size of one. Yeah. I think but that's very dangerous to do back tests. Like so that. look, the, the story is this is happening late cycle, it's dangerous, it's rare. It increases the chance that something goes wrong somewhere, be it in the economy, be it in a leveraged business model, in credit, in housing, I don't know where, but it increases the chances that something goes wrong. Interest rates are going higher. So that means your starting point in buying bonds is higher yields. That means the chance you get to generate a sharp drop in yields and therefore very high returns is actually higher. So it might take longer and because the Fed's ends are tied by high inflation, it might get some more quarters for the Fed to cave into pressure. 
but we're basically exerting more pressure on the economy, more pressure on markets right late in the cycle. And we are providing investors with a higher bond yield as an entry for their portfolio edge, mm -hmm. which means that I don't know if in the next three or six or nine months, there is a higher chance something goes wrong with the higher entry in bond yields, which makes your bond position more likely to generate outsized returns over the next 12 months. So what do you think is what's going to break? If in 2018, it was the high yield bond market, if in March 2020, it was everything. If in 2008, it was the banking system, what, what do you think is going to, to break? And might it be, you know, it's, rather than you know, having black and white thinking, something's either going to break or everything's going to be fine and dandy, we can have something in the middle of, it didn't shatter, but it's not looking great. And the Fed needs to intervene. And they're not going to cut 500 basis points. They only cut 100. I think my, it's always very hard to pinpoint these things because they tend to happen where you least expect them, right? And I don't know why, but my gut feeling goes towards somewhere in Europe. I think the, the level of borrowing rates is something that in Europe we are completely not used to. And it's, it's a situation where you have a very high amount of refinancing cliffs coming. You have oil prices that are making, the, you know, making it tougher on European consumers. You start already from recessionary starting points, check. I have to think that uh, Europe is a very vulnerable place. Now, don't get me wrong. It might happen that we get it somewhere in Australia. Yeah. Like I said, I have no idea, but looking at the information I have today, I think Europe and the UK look particularly vulnerable to some credit event somewhere. And you might be asking yourself as a US listener, maybe, do I care about it? Well, the market freaked out on uh, some small banks being run like cowboys. Okay? That was, with hindsight, that, that is what happened. The market at some point was pricing the Fed to cut rates. I repeat, the market was pricing the Fed to cut rates this summer, this yeah. summer the past summer. Okay? So we're pricing a higher 50% chance yeah. that Powell would cut rates this summer. This was the level of how much markets freaked out. In March, after... The banking? Yes, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. in March. So at the peak of the March panic, the bond market was pricing the 50% chance that Powell would cut rates by June, July, past June, July, okay? Yeah. So this was the level of stress in markets caused by, in hindsight, a few banks being run like cowboys. And I actually think, just I'm just, I could be wrong, but that it was so bad, the, the uh, surge in, you know, the, the rally in rates, and it was a very crowded trade shorting rates beforehand, that the March meeting was priced as probably going to stay flat, but there's a more likely chance of a cut than a hike. Yeah. Which, that's, which, yeah. which is incredible. For like right? a few hours. You know? that, that's what I mean. Yeah, the yeah, market yeah. went into a higher chance of a cut than a hike. That's how much we freaked out. Okay. Uh, so if it happens in Europe, but it's systemically important. So it happens, I don't know, in European real estate or in some place, which is a large market cap, which has reverberation into pension funds investments, and it has several connections around the world, it might be big enough to scare markets systemically and not only um, European markets. So I don't know where it happens, but the usual suspects are highly leveraged business models, um, places with high refinancing cliffs coming. Uh, but again, because we are testing really the waters everywhere in the world, Every bond market, basically almost every bond market is bear steepening. We're applying the same narrative everywhere, including in countries and in jurisdictions that are more vulnerable because maybe they have a higher floating rate private sector borrowing market. Maybe they have more refinancing cliffs. Maybe they have other reasons. You're applying the same pattern everywhere. This is bound to make some damage, serious damage somewhere. I can't get my hands on where. Uh, it's often where you expect it the least, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, do you think that... Are European banks better suited to, uh, for what's to come than U.S. banks because they have shorter duration assets? So they actually will have lower mark-to-market losses, even if they're not marking it because it's hold to maturity? So uh, the European Central Bank stress test this. Is that the word? That's a yeah. stress test yeah, yeah. On, the um, on the interest rate risk that European banks are running at an overall balance sheet level. So European banks are forced to report what is the net impact on their capital 
that a 100 or 200 basis point move would make on their entire balance sheet. And does it include held to maturity? Everything. Really? So in the US, it's not? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys don't like to make tight regulation, but yeah. in Europe, we do a lot of things wrong. That is a very big difference. Strong stress testing is a thing that we do in Europe. And so so uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank's official capital ratios, you know, the minimum is like you know, five or six, or, and then it's higher for you know, lo, lo, larger banks, but they were officially, their capital was fine. Yeah, sure. Uh, because, because so much, they had $100 billion of securities in their held maturity, which they did not have to report yeah, the losses on. Sure. So, I mean, the stress testing for small US banks is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But even for large banks, JP Morgan isn't forced to report that figure that I mentioned yeah. before. They do it anyway, yeah. but they, they aren't forced to do that. In Europe, you are forced. Every bank has to stress test their interest rate risk on the entire balance sheet. They have to tell the ECB, I'm going to lose 5% of capital, 7, 10, 20% of capital if interest rates move up by 200 basis points. Okay? The last stress test showed that the median European bank would lose about 5 to 7% of their capital if interest rates moved higher by 100, 200 basis points. They've moved higher than that. Yeah. So European banks have taken a hit on their capital, which is fine, but also they're making more money because yeah. they can land at much higher interest rates and deposit rates in Europe are relatively sticky. They're going up, but not by a lot. Yeah. Okay? For, for instance, in Europe, we don't have a money market industry. It's not like AF can take money out of a bank and invest in a money market fund. Yeah. There is no money market fund industry really? in Europe. So every jurisdiction is really different. But yes, because of tighter regulation in Europe, because of the nature of the market, I think European banks are, um, the median European bank is less at risk from higher interest rates than it is the median U.S. bank. On now, an economic sense, on a reported sense, it might officially be greater, but that's just because U.S. is playing a hide the, hide the donkey. Yeah, Correct. Hide the donkey. So I, I made up. The other, <laughs> the other story is credit because banks can go under pressure late cycle. People look at this interest rate sensitivity, but really what happens is that the credit quality of their asset book deteriorates. That's the biggest risk. Because yeah. the Fed basically said, hey, I'm going to subsidize all your interest rate losses. If you didn't hedge, you can post the treasuries yeah. at me, at the BTFP, at par. par. Yeah. If they trade at 50 cents, I don't care. To me, they're worth yeah. 100. Bank term funding program, yeah. Two, set up two days after SVB failed. Yeah. The ECB could do the same, okay? And if it's pension funds with the same problem, they could set up a special vehicle where even a pension fund can post their treasuries at the Fed or their booms at the ECB. When it comes to collateral value of bonds, the central bank can always try to fix that. And generally, they're effective in doing that. When it comes to credit quality, if, house, if the, the commercial real estate sector, if the housing market, if credit quality is deteriorating, the credit quality of the asset side of the loan book of a bank, the ECB can't do anything about it. They can't say to a European bank, um, Ah, your real estate uh, mark to market of your of your loan book is down by twenty percent. Don't worry, I unilaterally decide that housing prices are twenty percent higher, yeah. so you're done. That doesn't happen. So it's the credit deterioration really that it's bank very bad late cycle, and there I'm not sure that European banks are doing better than U.S. banks because the credit quality of these European borrowers in general, as we discussed, because of the refinancing cliffs isn't looking particularly good. And also because of negative interest rates in Europe, negative interest rates, European banks were forced to take more credit risk over the last three to ah, five years. Point. They went into more leveraged loans, leveraged real estate business, CLOs, other types of more aggressive lending, covenant light loans. So basically, I'm not going to yeah, say yeah. my own experience, but back when I was in the European banking industry, with negative interest rates, you were bleeding money, literally, as a European bank, you couldn't charge your depositors negative interest rates. So you were charging them zero, and you were paying to the ECB negative 50 basis points. So you understand that's not really viable. You were looking to produce any asset check at any yield that was acceptable, okay? Corporates, at some point, had a great pricing power over banks. They would show up and they would say, give me money. I'm looking for funds. I have 10 other banks lined up. Yep. And in the European uh, world, bank lending represents a huge portion of credit creation. Unlike in America. Unlike in America. So banks are a huge source of credit for the Eurozone. 
And then corporates would say, look, I have 10 banks lined up. Uh, I am going to decide the terms. And the terms are going to be saying that it is covenant light. So if my leverage goes above a certain ratio, I don't have a penalty. No penalties. Crop that out. I mean, you have to lend to me whatever. These are the conditions I decide. And banks didn't really have an alternative. If they wanted to generate margin and be competitive, they had to lend. So they took more risks. So it's not a lot about interest rate risk and hedging. That matters. But credit quality can't be hedged or backed up by central banks. And that's what worries me the most when it comes to the banking system right now. Thanks, Alf. It's been a pleasure. Uh, tell us about what you're, the work you're doing at the Macro Compass, as well as, it's also true you have a, a bond course. Was, how, how new is this bond course? And what do uh, people, what are you teaching people there? Uh, some parts we, we haven't discussed, uh, other parts we have discussed, but you go in much more detail than yes. what we've just talked about. So look, uh, I've been in bond markets professionally as an institutional player, and it always bugged me that it's a kind of a secretive market. It's full of jargon and technicalities and people get lost and they're confused. They understand it's important, but they're scared of it because of this jargon and technicalities. So I said to myself, well, this has to end. And how am I going to fix it? I made a bond market course. And the bond market course basically has the aim of unpacking all this jargon and technicalities and making it comprehensible for people, for retail investors, for people that are listening, so they can get the weapons to really understand what's going on in bond markets, which will also help them understand how to position their portfolios, what to do with equities, what to do with other assets they have. And so where can people find the bond force? Well, um, I want to as well give people a 20% off only to the first 50 people that will go and use the discount code MACRO20. And they can find the course on the macrocompass.com. Uh, we can also put a link maybe. Sure, we'll, we'll put a link. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so the first 50 people that buy it will get a 20% uh, off. It's on the macrocompass.com. And I really hope this course will help people understand the mechanics behind stuff like yield curve inversion. Mm -hmm. So in the course, we discussed about bear steepening and bull flattening and bull steepening. What do they mean? How do they relate to the growth cycle? What happens if growth is accelerating and you're having the bull flattening? Which sectors of the yield curve are you supposed to look at? All of this is finally, I hope, explained in a very comprehensible way. And that's what I wanted to achieve through this bond market course. There we go. So uh, looking forward to, to checking that out. Alf, thank you so much for coming on, uh, uh, sharing your views. And obviously, people can find you on Twitter at MacroAlf. Where, where else? Uh, Alf, thanks so much. Thanks.